At one time were a letter that he sent to a, a, a group of churches and a group of Christians out in the boonies, separated from one another. And then you add to the separation and loneliness, isolation issues, there was a whole heap of trials and persecutions pounding down upon them. So I say that to remind you that everything that we're going to talk about in verses 1 to 9 of 1 Peter chapter 5 today are part of a discussion about how to understand and how to survive suffering and persecution. Despite being exiles and uh, separated and isolated, as Peter starts wrapping up his uh, five-chapter letter, and next week's the last week we're going to have in uh, 1 Peter, by the way, um, this last passage, far from being some kind of an insider paragraph that's um, only addressed to elders, it addresses a whole bunch of relationships. And it proves a point that I've always believed in, that relationships are really important. Not being an insider, uh, a little paragraph only for elders, that's because um, in, in chapters uh, 1 to 4, he doesn't all of a sudden say, okay, now I was talking to everybody else, now I'm just going to talk to the real insiders and to the leaders at the church. Uh, even though he starts to the elders among you, in the nine verses we're going to look at today, there's at least six different relationships that are being... Um, talked about. Uh, advice is being given on, on about, in about six different relationship angles. You could look at this. In the first four verses, it's elders to members, that relationship. But then right after that, it's, it's members to elders. And then after that, it's members to one another. Then it's uh, at the end of uh, chapter 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 7, there's our relationship with God is discussed here. Even our relationship with Satan, and then finally our relationship with the wider church. But indeed, there's some pretty important words here after all this talk about submission that are aimed at Christian leaders. That might make you think, well, isn't that like a little bit of a contradiction? Um, after all the talk about submissional Christianity, and we've repeated that line so many times in the last couple of months. Um, all of this talk, and, and, and now we're going to suddenly turn to uh, leaders. Well, let's uh, turn in our Bibles, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 9, and then we'll come back and uh, make some comments. Let me just turn there quick. How fast does it take, how long does it take Pastor John to find a passage? 1 Peter chapter 5, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Leadership. It's, it's been a tough couple of uh, years, maybe decades, for Christian leaders, especially in the area of integrity. Uh, the celebrity Christian leader disasters are, are just the famous ones, by the way. And if you're only going to base your observations on this phenomenon based on what you find on Twitter and other media, you might think that the problem is all celebrity related, but, and then the danger then is you fail to see that what Peter just wrote, all the advice and warnings that he just gave, 
He's speaking to leaders in likely small house meeting churches that are spread all over um, the area that he's writing to. Uh, and I also don't think that Peter's only recognizing and tra- challenging and talking to um, recognized elders either, uh, though he's certainly doing that, and we'll talk about how. Um, but he writes, he uses the word presbyteros, and uh, that's that word elder. And, and that can refer to some kind of an official like Andrew or Tiago in our own church, somebody in an official role. But it can also refer to a Bob or a Patsy. I don't mean to point you guys out too much, Bob and Patsy, but you just happen to be the elderest elders here uh, at church today. And uh, in Peter's day, a huge amount of honor and respect and deference was given to older people in that society. So with all of the ideas we've had about submission, if you're in that part of uh, the culture and the society in that part of a congregation, as a Christian, how would you use that weight and authority and deference that the congregation might give to you? Uh, If you're a younger person, how would you react to the fact that there are elders among you to whom you're supposed to give respect? So I think everything that we're going to say applies to that dynamic as well. Uh, I think a lot of that um, is sadly diminished in the culture to our loss. But uh, I need to make the chalk squeak and go right back to the leadership issues because uh, clearly Peter is talking to them. I, I know that because of the passage that I think he's referencing. Um, And I've always had a somewhat conflicted relationship with uh, the whole area called leadership studies. You've probably heard me emote about that in sermons before, especially how they apply to the local church. Now, uh, my critics might find that really not surprising. But, But what we see in politics with incredibly contentious definitions in the world that we live in, um, of which politicians on which side of the line are providing genuine leadership, Uh, this whole conversation can can get even more divisive when you think about that. I don't often have the guts to say it in a group setting or in in a seminar where there's a whole bunch of pastors in the room when the line gets dropped, and it gets dropped often, that it's all about leadership. I'm not always quick to admit out loud that I, I... I don't believe that is the most important thing, at least not the way they mean it. One of my commentators uh, this week uh, from my studies wrote this. I'm going to pretty much quote him in my own words, and many have his own words. And he wrote this, What I find is that anything worth calling leadership happens often without people thinking about it as such. When someone is so energetically and productively involved in whatever it is, whether making music or running a business, whether organizing a retail store or heading up a government department, that they communicate that energy and productivity, that enthusiasm and effectiveness to those around him. And here's what he wrote that it really caught me. Leadership, in other words, is a bit like friendship. It's something that happens best when you're not thinking about leadership or friendship as it might be, but whatever it is that you're actually doing together. You know, he basically goes on to say that it's, it's similar um, where, uh, with friendship, where if friendship is something that turns in on itself, if you make it your life goal to collect as many friends as you can, because then you're just kind of chasing popularity. But there's something about being friendly and other-centered that ends up being very powerful and, uh, you know, starts to spread. But I'll, I'll stop there, because whether you're a huge fan of what is one of the longest shelves at chapters, and that's the one where they display all the books on leadership. Um, I don't need to get into an argument with you this morning because it would be one-sided anyway because I'm doing all the talking. But the good news is Peter didn't really necessarily write to leaders. And what I mean by that is he writes to shepherds. What he wrote was written to shepherds, and that's a humble title. And it's an especially significant title in our Bibles It's especially relevant to sheep that are separated from the main flock on faraway hills because he's writing to elect exiles in dispersion. Look at Peter's humility even as he begins this passage. He says, I appeal to you as an elder. That might sound like a power move, but if you remember from the very beginning of this passage, the whole series on 1 Peter, if you flip back in your Bibles to the very first verse at the beginning of the letter, Peter identifies himself as an apostle. So he could have said, as an apostle, I now want to talk to you elders. 
No, but he takes this title himself. He says, as an elder, I appear as a fellow, uh, I appeal as a fellow elder. Uh, when I was in Bible college and seminary, my professors, many of my professors, had a side hustle as pastors. And some of my professors were pastors that had a side hustle as professors. Did I get that right? Some were professors with a side hustle of uh, pastors, and some were pastors with a side hustle of professors. Some of them were just simply completely professors, and that was their entire job and role. Um, I don't think that, I, I, don't, I don't ascribe to the idea that automatically or, or for sure it would be far better if a Bible college or a seminary teacher were an active pastor while they're teaching. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's necessary. However, the ones that were the ones that had that dual role, there's a little bit of a nuance that came to their teaching ministry to us, especially depending on the topic. And um, so Peter is an apostle with a side hustle as an elder, and uh, he has a lot to say to them um, from his uh, experience. To, to the, look, at his, look at his resume here, a an fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. It's interesting how he does that, because if we remember Peter's life story when we, in the fall, when we studied the whole life narrative of Peter in the Gospels, he was a guy who really had a little bit of a bad habit of always trying to exert his influence and push his weight around a little bit. And here he is now, he's grown and matured, and he's coming into this discussion a lot more humble. In fact, even as he inter- identifies himself, he says, witness of Christ's suffering. He's an elder, a witness of Christ's suffering. That's the big deal to Peter here in his credentials. I've seen a lot of things, he said, but this is the most significant thing I've seen. That's that's a huge part of his credential, that he was a witness to Christ's suffering. Why why do I think that's significant? Well, because I'm a pastor shepherd, and I know a lot of pastor shepherds, and when we tend to get a little tired and uh, curmudgeonly, if that's a specific uh, technical term, and it happens, you, you, you know that you're, something starts happening where you start having a bit of a pity party, <laughs> and, and you, it comes from a place that's not a great place, and you start thinking about, about all the things I've suffered, all the sacrifices I've made, and all the things I've given up. Peter says, I'm an elder who's a witness to the sufferings of Christ. <laughs> That's his credentials. Everything else kind of pales. Like two years ago, Janine and I went on that crazy hike uh, around Mont Blanc in Europe, and uh, we climbed some hills that now that we've climbed those hills and experienced that suffering, if we ever get a chance to go back to Lake Placid and do the little three-hour hikes that we used to think were big hills, it's not going to be as intimidating anymore. I think what Peter's seen puts all of whatever suffering or things that he's had to give up in perspective. Peter will suffer. Good tradition tells us that Peter eventually is going to die on a cross himself. And he's going to request to be nailed to a cross upside down because he, he doesn't consider himself worthy to, to be crucified the same way his Savior was. That's not from our Bibles, but it's a well-attested piece of tradition. But Peter doesn't brag about his own suffering or complain about it here. He focuses on the suffering of Christ. Remember our submission to authority um, uh, narrative arc in Jesus' life we talked about? Um, And we've talked about that in Peter. Well, uh, in 1 Peter, in Jesus' life, Peter's saying the same thing here. He says he's he's one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. So Peter says, I've seen Jesus. I witnessed Jesus' suffering. I know what happened to him. But he says, I also know that I will share in the glory to be revealed later on. So that's important because Peter's going to, uh, he's going to end with, uh, you know, some warnings. He's going to go hard on shepherds who aren't in it for the right reason. But he ends with this this promise. And when the chief shepherd appears, verse 4, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. By the way, I don't believe that's an elder-exclusive uh, deal there. <laughs> so he's talking about this great reward, but, but that doesn't mean that that's a reward only for elders. 
being sharing in this crown of glory when you've been faithful to your calling. I think that's a every disciple thing to look forward to someday. But in, in the context of being leaders and being shepherds um, of God's flock, there's an extremely common mistake made by elders that has a 2,000-year history. And even beyond that, in Israel's history before Peter's day, there were serious shepherding issues. Long before celebrity pastor disaster era that we live in now, the common mistake was premature, uh, I'm going to call it premature crownification. (laughs) And that's either a do-it-yourself crown or the one that the people that you're leading want to give you. And Peter's saying, that's not the crown you want. That's not the crown you're working for. He's recommending delayed crownification (laughs) to wait for that one that's to come when the great shepherd comes and gives us our reward in the future. So, so here's, there's that narrative then. There's a lot of suffering, but afterward there's going to be glory. We talked about that last week on Resurrection Sunday, that Jesus is the first fruits, right? We, we spent a lot of time on that word. So Peter's talking about that here for, for leaders and I think for all of us. Um, you see, Peter is merely applying um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you're a note taker, write down Matthew chapter 6. And crack that open in your Bible later this afternoon and go back and read that great chapter. Because that's the part in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus reminds everybody about all of our good works. Anything that we do is a result of our praise and worship and obedience to God. Do it. You don't need to do it for the applause of people. In fact, don't do it for the applause of people or that's the only thing you're going to get from. If you want to serve God and do great works in order to be approved by men, knock yourself out, but that's all you're going to get. Never forget that your God, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you. So that, that's what I mean, how this applies for all of us, not just for shepherds. Well, what about these warnings? Verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Don't think for a minute that Peter's writing this just because there's, there's examples in his day in the first century of this happening, and, and, and this is a new problem, and uh, he should address this now, completely fresh. Everything that he wrote there, I believe, is a complete application out of a very famous but rarely preached upon passage of Scripture in Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, and why do I say it's rarely preached upon? Because it's usually your pastor that's doing this job. And, and take a look to uh, how Ezekiel chapter 34 sounds. Here's Ezekiel 34 starting uh, in verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. And that's just the intro. So you can understand why shepherds aren't lining up to ask, say, hey, can I take Ezekiel 34 a week and preach this one? God cares a lot for his flock. So Peter says, so, 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 why you do this matters. Um, why, why you seek to be... With that background, you know, to, 
And Peter's really summarizing, I think, that whole chapter in Ezekiel. What's the point Peter's really trying to make? I think it's the same point we've been coming back to time and time again through this whole letter of 1 Peter. That's why this week as I was looking at this, it really kind of triggered for me how this fits in with the whole um, discussion in 1 Peter about submission. This, this whole idea of submission and submissional Christianity, it's an incredibly wide application that, that comes from this teaching and this idea. A, a key reminder in this whole section is that some of you may be shepherds and some may be sheep. But if you are a shepherd, you must never forget that you are not the shepherd. And if they may be Sheep in the flock, you must never forget that they're someone else's sheep. You know, that, can you see now where power and power plays and power struggles in a local church congregation? Now, now it's like as people are trying to dominate one another and have their own way and, and intimidate and manipulate and all of this kind of stuff. It's like, these are God's people. This is God's flock. God really cares what happens to them. Uh, for people who like to spend a lot of time on the idea that elders rule, uh, who tend to mine the Scriptures searching for passages that solidify their right to, to authority, it's not easy to really make sense of the next relationship in our series here. We have to keep moving. In the same way, Peter says, verse 5, you who are younger, who are not elders, submit yourself to your elders. In the same way. It's hard to work out what that means if you kind of looked at all of this stuff about elders and thought, okay, a few people have all the power and they don't need to submit to anybody, but you other people need to submit. Then why does Peter say in the same way? In the same way. We looked at that same little word play in the passage about marriages, right? Husbands and wives. And it said husbands in the same way. Well, I think we can unpack it when Peter sums up both relationships with this. Um, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. I had an idea that really wouldn't work so well in our current format of uh, video and fusion, and it certainly wouldn't work if you knew how late I thought of this idea. But just give myself, give me credit for being super creative this morning, and imagine how creative it would have been if, uh, like Mr. Dress Up, Ernie Coombs, I brought a big trunk that's filled with costumes. If you're of my vintage or a little younger, you know, Mr. Mr. Dress Up had this trunk that he would pull costumes out of once in a while. And so I got this, I've got this trunk here, a big wooden box, and it's filled with all different kinds of uniforms. You don't know what kind of uniforms they are yet, but that's what's in my box. So I imagine in this scenario, I'd open the lid, and I would pull out an army jacket and a helmet. And I imagine Boaz would probably be the first one to yell out, Soldier! It's a soldier's uniform. And then I can reach in, and uh, one thing we have a lot of at our house are scrubs. I could pull out some scrubs, and people say, A nurse or a surgeon. Right, right, right. And then I pull out like a flak jacket, and they would say, A policeman or an Irish mailman, <laughs> you know, from a flak. That's a little bit of a joke. Anyhow, What could I pull out of that box when I lifted it up that would make you immediately identify and shout out, Christian? What would the uniform be? Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility. I got to think that Peter would probably say it's a towel. Because how can he not be thinking about the time when it was just before the Passover festival? Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Interesting here, there's Satan And what's his ploy here is to separate Judas from Jesus. We're going to come back to that a little bit later, if I can remember. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. There's that narrative arc. So, 
He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus is basically wearing their dirt on his outfit. Peter famously objected then. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not reading from Scripture. We remember when he gets to Peter, Peter famously it kind of objects to what Jesus is doing. But now in his letter, 30, 40 years later, he's recommending you and I do the same thing. John goes on in chapter 13 of John, and he says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. That's what Jesus did in his life. He left the table, got down at ground level and dirty, then he returned to his place. Um, Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them you'll receive the crown of glory from the great shepherd when he returns. All of that, Peter's writing, because Jesus knew then in John 13, and Peter came to learn, going back to our passage, because God opposes the the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Remember that harsh warning in Ezekiel? God said, I am against the shepherds who are doing it this way. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Here's our relationship with God now being described. That He may lift you up in due time. In due time. There's that timing thing again. Remember I talked about premature crowning yourself or taking crowns from people? Relax. Don't worry about that part. In due time. God may lift you up. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. This is all describing our relationship with God and it connects submission with a proper perspective. There is a God and you're not Him. We spend far too much time thinking we direct the hand of God when we're supposed to humble ourselves under it. Be directed by it. Cast all your anxiety on Him Because he cares for you. When a believer says nobody cares, those are the words of a person who has lost or is losing their faith. He cares for you. He cares for you. Forward memory verse. You just memorized a verse. I know it's not a whole verse, but that's how you meditate on Scripture. He cares cares for you. I bet if you tried to say that every hour in the next seven days in the middle of another lockdown (laughs) and all of the things that are we're worried about, all of the setbacks, all of the trials that come your way, He cares for you. You should never, the word should never come out of your mouth, believer in Christ, that nobody cares. Verse 8 and 9, the the next relationship. This one's an interesting one. Finally, after all this submission, there's someone that we get to resist. (laughs) If you want to join a resistant movement, here's the one to join. Here is your ticket. Here's the one you're supposed to fight against and resist. That's the good news. The bad news, he's a pretty serious enemy. You don't want to resist this one while you are out from under the mighty hand of God. Right? To place yourself under the mighty hand of God, that's another submission move. Um, there is a God, I'm not Him. But that's probably the position you want to be in when you're trying to resist this other guy. Verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This is a favorite passage for Zoom sermons. And by Zoom sermons, I don't mean the ones where you're at home watching online and the sound's really lousy. (laughs) I mean, when you just zoom in on a passage and just start talking as if it completely explains itself without any context or without any, being any part of a larger discussion. And, and this one's really important for that. Um, Peter's nearly finished his letter. And uh, do you suppose he suddenly out of the blue just, you know, put his, put his pen down and thought, hmm, okay, I'm almost done here. Let's see, is there anything else that I haven't thought of? Anything else I should say before I put this in the, roll up the scroll and put it in the bag and send it off? Uh, you know, I should probably remind people that the devil's a really bad dude and he's really powerful, and they should avoid him. Yeah, I'm going to add that. I I don't think that's it at all. I think this is totally part of everything that Peter's been saying all along. Uh, If you just look at that that verse by itself on the screen right now, and you think about all that we've been talking about in the past months about submission. Remember, I, I brought it into the discussion there when I was reading from John 13 at the Last Supper. And John's setting it all up. And at this moment, Satan had entered into Judas to have him betray Jesus. There's this division, right? Right there. Um, If you think of all the things we've talked about in the past month, uh, even the things we've talked about today, the way we care for the flock, the way we cooperate with those in authority over us, even in church, the call to clothe ourselves with humility, to clothe ourselves with that towel. There is a tendency... There's an alternative way to approach any of these uh, kind of scenarios. It's an al- by alternative, I mean evil or sinful. And every one of the relationships in 1 Peter's entire letter, which, which would include the way we react to one another in chapter 2, the way we submit to human authority in chapter 2, the way we react to bosses or masters in chapter 2, wives and husbands to one another in chapter 3, the way we interact with those who persecute us for our faith in chapter 4, the way we react to suffering that comes upon us according to God's will in chapter 4. And what's the tendency? What's the tempting alternative? Pride. Pride. I read a really lousy statistic recently that in a huge survey done in the U.S. among conservative Protestant clergy that over 30% of them score on the spectrum for narcissistic personality disorder. It's kind of like, ooh, that's a high percentage. I'm not taking that test. See, pride doesn't mix well with submission. Pride doesn't mix well with an other-centered focus. Pride doesn't enable marital intimacy. Pride doesn't bring congregations together because pride divides, pride tears down, pride destroys. Pride is satanic. And God, by the way, opposes the proud, and the proud, for the record, the feelings are mutual. God opposes the proud, and the proud oppose God. It's not a great move, by the way. It's not the first time in this letter that Peter has recommended alert sobriety, but this time it's alert thinking, sober thinking, because pride is intoxicating. In an article on the C.S. Lewis Institute site, and I posted this last night on our church Facebook page, so you could read the whole, it's a one-page article, It's phenomenal, talking about the issue of pride throughout Scripture and in the Christian life. And here's a couple of quotes from that article by a man named Tom Terrence. He said, It would be easy to conclude that pride is the special problem of those who are rich, powerful, successful, famous, or self-righteous. But that is wrong. It takes many shapes and forms and affects all of us to some degree. The widespread chronic preoccupation with self in American culture, for example, is rooted in pride and can give rise to or intensify our emotional problems. And then he goes on in his article to cite all kinds of powerful biblical examples showing uh, how humility is so Satan-resisting. 
Humility is Satan resistant. And we usually think of like locked down moral self-discipline and moral strength as the primary way to resist Satan. But humility is Satan resistant. In the life of a congregation, in your relationship with God, with the people that you may be entrusted to care for, in the people that are caring for you, with the other people in your congregation, with people that are persecuting you, with uh, other churches, other relationships. Humility is Satan resistant. He concludes this in his article, as we refuse to be preoccupied with ourselves and our own importance and to seek to love and serve others, it will reorient us from self-centeredness to other-centeredness, to serving and caring for others just as Jesus did for us. In the narcissistic culture of contemporary America, this is a particularly powerful counter-cultural witness of Christ's presence and lordship in our lives. That was a mouthful, so I'm going to read that last line again. In this narcissistic, it's all about me, culture of contemporary America, this is a particularly powerful countercultural witness of Christ's presence and lordship in our lives. I was talking to a friend here just before the service about our, our vision statement that we believe our calling is to display Jesus as the center of all life and how that's really virtue signaling. You know, that gets made fun of a lot. That's virtue signaling. You're doing that in order to display some virtue. Yeah, display Jesus as the center of all life. How do you do that? Clothing yourself with humility. Uh, a beautiful little example picture, you know, some of our families in the, before the pandemic lockdown where it was kind of like, should we even be going out right now? But children, sixth grade and under, down the street with bags, raking leaves, just, just doing an act of service. Why? Because it's formational. Because you got to do something in this culture you, we live in as you're raising children to push back against the glorification of the self and, and use the tool and the, the, the stirrups and the training wheels of little service opportunities in order to push back. Because humility is Satan resistant. He goes on to say in his article, true humility is our greatest friend. It increases our hunger for God's Word and opens our hearts to His Spirit. It leads to intimacy with God, who knows the proud from afar, but dwells with Him, Isaiah 57, who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. It imparts the aroma of Christ to all whom we uh, we encounter. It's a sign of greatness in the kingdom of God in Luke 22. He says, developing the identity, attitude, and conduct of a humble servant does not happen overnight. It's rather like peeling an onion. You cut away one layer only to find another beneath it. But it does happen. As we forsake pride and seek to humble ourselves by daily deliberate choices and dependence on the Holy Spirit, humility grows in our souls. Fenelon said it well, humility is not a grace that can be acquired in a few months. It is the work of a lifetime. And it is a grace that is precious in the sight of God, who in due course will exalt all who embrace it. Which is what Peter said, right? God opposes the proud, but gives grace and help to the humble. So he said, humble yourself then in the sight of God, and he will lift you up in due time. Humility is needed for shepherds. It's needed for sheep. It's a key but way too often overlooked and underutilized form of Satan resistance. It's needed worldwide because Peter concludes this by saying, you know that the family of believers throughout the world, God's flock everywhere, is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good shepherd who is also the great shepherd. 
Jesus is the good shepherd by every definition of that word. He did his shepherding well. He did it in such a way that even his harshest critics would have to say was done in goodness in the example that he set. We've already looked at that first time that uh, the disciples met around the Lord's table, that he defined the good shepherd by clothing himself in humility, wrapping that towel around and going around a table, including that one Judas who was about to betray him. But he's also the great shepherd that he said in that passage, you call me Lord and it's right because that is what I am. And as the great shepherd, he still took the path of humility as the good shepherd. And Lord, now as we prepare to receive these two elements, we, we see how serious he was about that. And we remember this morning his sacrifice. And as we, we come to the Lord's table and we take the bread and we take the cup, we're reminded of his great sacrifice. So Lord, we pray that uh, you will presence yourself here with us, even as we prepare our hearts to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our worship team are going to lead us in.